Welcome to Combat Sports Talk, a podcast dedicated to UFC discussion, Bellator, the MMA community, and combat sports in general. I'm your host, Ryan Smith, and joining me this week, as he does every week, is our co-host, KC Onyebuchi. Yeah, excited. <laughs> it didn't even feel natural. Yeah, yeah that one, I, I, you know, I'm assuming that was supposed to be a Jamaican accent. <laughs> I, hey, man, I me like think that was supposed that was to be a, a Jamaican accent. <laughs> that wasn't even close. That was my uh, California surfer. Was it really? Yeah, just leave. Can we move on, please? All right. Uh, I, I, yes, we can. <laughs> There were two <laughs> fights this weekend. Bellator <laughs> made its way to Thackerville, Oklahoma at the Windstar Hotel and Casino. And the UFC, despite the week's tragedy, held its 215th pay-per-view at the T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas, Nevada. Let's look at some of the results from Bellator 184 and UFC 216 with the official decision. This is the official decision, our segment where we look at the fights from Friday and Saturday night. Now, since we only covered the main event of Bellator 184, we're going to focus on that result. But I do want to send a quick shout out to one of my hometown heroes who fought on the prelims of Bellator 184 on Friday night. Sean, Who was that? Yeah, there's a Sean <laughs> Razorback Holden defeated Shakir McKillop by TKO in round two. Now, this was a catchweight fight at 160. And for those of you who don't know what catchweight is, it's it's whenever there is a fight between two of the official weight classes. So basically before the fight, they agree that they're going to fight at some other weight than one of the official weight classes. This was at 160 pounds. But Sean Holden is based here in Dallas, and he's one of the trainers at the title boxing that I go to. And so I want to send him a shout out for his victory. It's always great to get a finish. And by the way, I did buy the walkout shirt. So nice. I'll be walking around with a with a Razorback shirt. So and it's not just going to be Combat Sports Talk for me anymore. It's going to be sometimes Combat Sports Talk t-shirt, sometimes Razorback. Well, I hope Sean can teach you a thing or two if you ever get the uh, the bravery to enter the ring with me again. Well, you know, I, I, I definitely I might take you up on that now that I have an entire championship <laughs> level uh, uh, coaching staff now. So this might happen. <laughs> That's rock solid. So what do we have on the card? All right. So in the main event. Darian the Wolf Caldwell defeated Eduardo Dantas by unanimous decision. Now we know Eduardo Dantas by another uh, by another term. <laughs> Doo doo. That's right, and it was pretty much that was his performance that night. Uh, it was a bantamweight fight for the title. Caldwell took Dantas down early and often. Um, you know. The, the, the move of the fight, though, was this suplex that it, I mean, it literally looked like he dropped Dantas on his head. I, I don't know why, how, how he stood, stayed awake after that. Yeah, you kind of got to love when MMA meets WWE. That's kind of dope. Absolutely. Well, it was unanimous decision. So there was a new bantamweight champion. For Bellator 184. So congrats out to Darian the Wolf Caldwell. Hope your reign is long and enjoyable. All right, let's get into UFC 216 coming to you from Las Vegas, Nevada in the T-Mobile Arena. The first fight of the night was a lightweight fight that's 155 pounds. Benil Dariush, number 12, and Evan Dunham fought to a draw. Now, we talked about Benil Dariush last week because he is this guy. That's right, he walks out to (laughs) rock with you. Which is still one of the greatest walkout songs. Well, here's the thing. Darius, uh, I mean, uh, Darius. Darius, there we go, usually walks out to Rock With You by Michael Jackson, but not this time. This time he walked out to a different song. It was this one. Oh, I can see the love in your That's right, Broken Vessels by Hillsong. 
that's actually kind of awesome. I couldn't hear anything because I was watching a Buffalo Wild Wings as per usual. But you know me being a church musician, kind of down for that. No, no. What are you talking about? How, how, how can you walk out to broken? I mean, if vest- you're notorious for terrible walkout music, you no, might as well. <laughs> how in the world are you gonna walk out to that? Let, let's listen to the lyrics one more time. Listen to the lyrics. <laughs> I can see the love in your eyes. You're walking out to that? Here's the thing. I'm pretty sure he needed to pray before this bout because the way it turned out, he, he should have been praying a little longer because that was not an amazing performance. They say draws are like kissing your sister. This is just all <laughs> kinds of wrong. Okay? <laughs> I, all I'm saying is, but Neil Darius does not understand the purpose of the walkout song. The walkout song is specifically <laughs> to get people you lost hyped. from the start. It's supposed to get you hyped. This is like freaking here comes the boom where uh where where you know uh Kevin James walking out to Holly Holy or whatever. You know, it's like you don't walk out to just it's a great movie. Yeah, you don't walk out to these kinds of just downer songs, man. I don't want to hear about broken vessels and amazing grace. I want to hear about Mama said knock you out. I want to hear about right. you know uh, notorious you know hypnotize. I don't want to hear th- this is the worst choice ever like Benil Darius sh- should have lost before he got into the <laughs> ring just because he played a, a broken vessels from Hillsong we absolutely have to do another fight soundtrack next show okay we'll do it we'll do a fight soundtrack next show but don't and <laughs> we'll, do, we'll do a little segment on what our, our walkout music will be I think it's changed since the last time we've done uh, it okay all right all right um so anyway he, he came out to broken vessels by hillsong uh darius took dunham down in in the first round did a ton of damage i think they scored yep. it a 10-8 dunham came back won the next two but whenever you win two rounds and someone has a 10-8 that the result is a draw so uh the, the you what know, sucks there is that darius really had opportunities where it looked like he was close to finishing dunham in in the first round like it was possible yeah, I just think uh, he gassed out and 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 Dunham just weathered the storm. Uh, yep. The cool the cool thing about Dunham, Evan Dunham, is that he lives in Las Vegas, and after the tragedy, uh, he came actually to the ring with the with that blue Las Vegas state flag, and and on it it read um, Vegas Strong. So that was really cool. Yeah, right on. All right, in the next fight, Mara Romera Barella defeated Kalindra Faria. By submission in the first round, you might remember that uh, I listed Kalindra Faria's uh, extensive uh, resume and said that that was going to be sufficient <laughs> to smash Barella. But uh, Barella pretty much put in quick work, just basically walking straight forward, taking Faria down, and then choked her out for the win. Yeah, we really need a crow uh, drop because you have to eat crow on this one yeah you know i i you you would you would think that uh the the i would eat crow by myself but you know fabricio el cavajo uh for doom <laughs> uh, d- defeated uh it was supposed to be Derek lewis but uh Derek lewis couldn't even get his tail out of the bed the, the day of the fight uh <laughs> That's not on me. Wait, no. There's no way I could have foreseen these circumstances. No, I'm just saying, this is the guy that you said was your upset pick from last week. I picked him for everything. You had him as a 50K contender last week. Dude didn't even, dude couldn't even get out of he, the bed. He was my upset pick because he left me upset. That was ridiculous. <laughs> get, your, get your life together, he's man. He's laying in the bed and he's like, my neck, my back is spinal. <laughs> My neck and my back. It's both of them, man. So, so we were talking about the fact that late fight replacements are never a good idea because the guy who comes in to fight is always the guy that's going to get led beat. To slaughter. So, but Walt <laughs> Harris, Walt Harris decides with five hours before the fight to fight former champion and <laughs> world class Brazilian jiu jitsu specialist. Fabrizio Verdun. <laughs> that fight lasted just about as long as we figured it would. Uh, it lasted what one minute place. and five seconds. 65 <laughs> seconds. You know what that means. No, it barely made the buffer factor. Oh, well, at least he beat the buffer factor. He beat the buffer factor. Just, 
That should be a rule. If you lose the buffer factor, you can't fight the rest of the year. You're just I, done. Well, you know, that's I don't know. But the but the fight was over. Walt Harris made basically a rookie mistake and it was the, you know, the fight was over. No. You know? <laughs> yeah. All There's right. not much commentary there. You just didn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Uh, so let's go to the co-main event. Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson defeated number three. Ray the Taz Mexican Devil Borg by submission in the fifth round. And still the flyweight champion at 125 pounds. Demetrius Johnson did it. He had 11 title defenses. It's now a record setting. He's the number one all-time champion in the UFC. Uh, This fight, KC, I know you saw it, but this fight was about as one-sided as a double-sided coin. (laughs) <laughs> here's the thing though it's like yeah it was one-sided but you really do have to give props for ray borg like when you're fighting demetrius johnson it's not whether or not you're gonna knock him out or take him down like your whole goal is how long can you last and the man held on through some storms like borg had no shot from start to finish it was just sheer power of determination not to just give up okay i, I like to think of it like like this is that one where you know Indiana Jones and the, and and Raiders of the Lost Ark. Mm-hmm. He was running from DJ like Indiana Jones <laughs> was running from that big ball. I mean, it was like DJ was just all over everything he did. DJ was there. You know, the only difference is Ray Ray Borg got splattered. All <laughs> he did. It, probably the most embarrassing part is when he's on Demetrius Johnson's back. Demetrius just shakes him off as though he was a child. That was I felt bad for Borg in that moment. Like, oh, you know you lost, right? Yeah, I mean that this is where we gotta be like see, this is where I get in trouble because now I what we need to be playing is like Jay Z, uh dirt off your shoulder. We gotta be playing some Taylor Swift, shake it off. <laughs> Because literally, it was like he finally got into a dominant position on on Demetrius. <laughs> or you thought. <laughs> and Demetrius just uh, does a little bitty of a shimmy, and the guy falls right off. It's like, is this guy? Somebody put God mode into this into this match right? because there is nothing that he Xbox can do. He plays. He's I just think it's constantly it is. in cheat mode. Yeah, you know, I think that's what it is. Is that he's found a way to port his video game self into real life. Let me just say this. Um, the statistics are DJ landed 172 strikes to Borg's 22. That's in five yeah. rounds. That is an eight to one margin. KC, this was like our fight. Like I hit you eight times for every one time you hit me. And I only needed to hit you once because of this power. So Yeah, but you still lost the fight. Anyway, <laughs> DJ did get the, and I call this, Performance of the night. This was my 50k contender. So yeah. uh, uh, the the downside though is performance of the night, and still no one's going to know about him outside of serious UFC fans. But they should, and this is the one thing that we have to I, like. I don't. I really racked my brain here on how to communicate this out via audio. The mighty arm armbar. So the finishing move that DJ executed expertly on Ray Borg. It was something that we had never seen in the UFC before. Um, Basically, DJ threw Ray Borg down, and while Ray Borg was on his way down, he flipped his legs over Ray Borg and pulled pulled his arm into an armbar submission. And, I mean, it was all one fluid move that no one had ever seen before, and that's how he ended the fight. I mean, what an exclamation point to put on a match and on a career that has been unmatched by anybody else in the history of the UFC. I I, I don't really know. Absolutely made a case for being the best pound for pound fighter. It's just too bad that he doesn't have enough pounds for it to matter. Okay, so so that is the question. That is my question to you. Is Demetrius Johnson the greatest of all time? Uh, is he the goat? No. Why not? Here's uh, and I hate to say it because mad respect to Demetrius, but there's something about being like the number one. Like he is unmatched as far as title defenses. But if you see him in the streets, you don't feel like, oh dear God, this guy might take me. It's he's too little. 
there's just it's just the it's just the appearance of it it's like so would you like even in an imaginary conversation do you think demetrius could ever take john jones no like there's an advantage to the bigger guy at all times so no matter how good you are at that weight it's kind of irrelevant that is the purpose of the pound for pound that is the whole purpose of the pound for pound is to say that if Demetrius Johnson wasn't five, three, but he was actually six, four as tall as, as John Jones, and he weighed yeah. 205 pounds instead of 125 pounds, would John Jones beat Demetrius Johnson? All things being equal. No, no. Uh, but the problem is we can't get past the cognitive bias of the fact that Demetrius is legitimately a tiny man. Okay. All right. Uh, this Well, that's just me. That's just me. I, I could be wrong. Uh, yeah, you are wrong. You, <laughs> Demetrius I mean, Johnson according the, to the pound per pound rankings, I'm wrong. But you mean to tell me if Demetrius Johnson walked in mad at you, you'd be worried? Yes. Because his <laughs> he would leg kick me to death, man. And I can't take leg kicks. I'm just not going to do it. He's just going to – what am I going to do? He's going to tire me out and choke me out because I, I won't be able to land any punches on him. He does too fast. Like, I, I would be con- seriously concerned. I'm actually concerned for you that you're talking uh, smack to Mr. Johnson. Look, here's the thing. Demetrius is an amazing fighter, but that scenario is never going to happen. All, all I got to say is this. Every time you say but, you cancel out everything you're going to say. So, therefore, you don't think Demetrius Johnson. I, Mr. Johnson, I just want to say don't get mad at me for the, the words. Forgive KC. <laughs> forgive KC for Johnson. what he says. He knows not what he does. Their apologies. <laughs> he knows not what he does. All uh, right. And. In the main event, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event of the evening. Number two, Tony L. Kukui Ferguson defeated number seven, the Motown phenom Kevin Lee by submission in round three. Casey, who'd you have in that fight? I'm just wondering. Uh, bef- shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't even want to do this with you right now. Shut up. That's right. You had Kevin Lee, the Motown Only phenom. The, the, we the, both knew that Ferguson was going to win from the jump. Okay. All I got to say is, is that Kev- the only thing that I learned about Kevin Lee in this fight is that he can be a jerk. I, I, I just, I, I found he that a terrible it was, self-promoter. He was, he was terrible. And I just, I, I, I felt more and more outraged at him and and i don't know why it just i, I guess this uh, he played the part of the heel to he, he played it really really well to the point where it's impossible to like this guy and it's how do you root for him it's just you just can't anyway so here's other things that kevin lee did wrong while he was preparing for this fight dude nearly mixed weight missed weight uh, so whenever you weigh in, you have to weigh in for a championship fight exactly at the weight. So that was 155 pounds. Kevin Lee comes out there, weighs 156. Now, uh, we're going to talk about what he was doing bef- yep. the day before and why he missed weight. But then when the, he, he had an hour to lose an extra pound because he came in at 156 pounds. So he had to lose an extra pound. Then the day of the fight, when he comes out, he's jumping around like like he's already won the fight. Oh, yeah. That was a ridiculous entrance. And it's just one of those that, for me, I, I told you uh, off the air that I, I thought he lost it from the very stare down. Like, he's just doing too much. Just uh, all of his antics really didn't, uh, uh, to me, uh, exude confidence. It was just uncontrolled energy yeah so i you know there's something out there called the adrenaline dump and it's when someone gets so hyped up and so you know nervous that they they feel themselves with this nervous energy brought about by the adrenaline of being in the moment and what happens is is that your body can only sustain that level of energy for a very short period of time and when you're in the octagon when you're fighting five minute rounds by the end of that second round if you're if you're all hyped up on adrenaline 
you're going to have what's called an adrenaline dump. And that's just like when you have you come off your sugar high or your caffeine high. You, he, you hit rock bottom and you have low Definitely energy. Crash. Yeah. And he, and he crashed. And so after the second round, it was very interesting. I went, I went back and listened to the audio of what was in, happening in the corner. And Kevin Lee actually admitted that he was tired at the end of the second round to his corner. Well, it seemed pretty obvious. I mean, um, this is where you and I probably should start live tweeting more during the fights. But uh, as I was sitting around the table, there was like uh, I called that he was he was definitely going to gas by the end of the second, and coming into the third is where he was going to have trouble, and it, it wasn't going to be a victory uh, standing up. That it had to be a submission thing because there was there was going to be an opportunity for Ferguson there. Yeah, and absolutely, you were right. Uh, for once, and uh, it was uh, <laughs> round three submission. Tony Tony Ferguson becomes the interim champion while he waits for the lightweight champion Conor McGregor to make up his mind. Now it was really interesting. After the fight, he calls out Conor McGregor. What did he call him? McNuggets. Yes, McNuggets. That was the best. McNuggets, <laughs> and he tells Conor McGregor, Conor McNuggets McGregor, to either defend the title or vacate. So. What do you think? You think Connor's going to defend or you think he's going to vacate? The right move is for him to vacate because if he saw the same fight we saw, he knows he's got no shot. That's the thing is Connor's had a cakewalk to his victories. Um, uh, I think Ferguson completely exposes Connor. Well, I you know I I think that Connor is, I think Connor should vacate too. I don't think Connor is really anything to fight for. Dude made a hundred million dollars getting beat up by Floyd Mayweather. So <laughs> yeah, what, there's no upside to this. What, you what are going to tarnish yeah. your legacy here. Yeah, I mean, so he's Connor said that he's going to come back and fight because he wants to legitimize the championship, which I think is is, is a valiant thing. But if your first fight <laughs> back <laughs> is Tony Ferguson. <laughs> You might yeah. want to rethink your career options and possibly go into selling, I don't know, whiskey. <laughs> yeah. Focus on your whiskey and clothing line because Ferguson's going to undo that legacy real quick. Absolutely. All right. So let's close the book on this week's action and put it back on the shelf. This card is history. The UFC 216 was the bomb. And it's time to check out the fallout from all the action with finding <laughs> the angles. Why are you laughing? <laughs> that was terrible wordplay. <laughs> okay, they can't all be singers. Finding the angles. All right, this is Finding the Angles, our segment where we cover the topics and headlines that people are talking about this week. First topic. The MMA world bows down to DJ, except for KC Onyebuchi, the yeah. only hater in the in the whole the whole Again, planet. Not a hater, just a realist. The dude is one of the baddest fighters ever to exist. However, he's also pocket size. All right, so Joe Rogan has called him the greatest ever. Dana Joe White. Joe Rogan believed that. Don't um, say it. Ronda Rousey could knock out Floyd. Mack. Way, uh, I can't even. Waymeather, so ridiculous. Floyd Waymeather, <laughs> is that who? He probably, she probably could. Floyd Waymeather. <laughs> oh, I, I hate you so much. <laughs> so yeah, irrelevant. Waymeather, erroneous on all counts. <laughs> okay, Dana White admitted. Everybody, like everybody's, come up to pay to pay homage to Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson. So my question for you is: the MMA world has now accepted it. DJ is the greatest MMA fighter, pound for pound, in the world. But what does the UFC need to do now to make Mighty Mouse an actual star? Like. Conor McGregor level, John Jones level, uh, Ronda Rousey level, Chuck Liddell. You know, the list goes on and on and on. George St. Pierre. What does the UFC need to do to make Demetrius Johnson that guy? Those guys. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Demetrius has to become a heel. That's the only way. No. He can't. I'm telling you. Because he's, he is a legitimately a good guy. He's someone that on Instagram, he, he's fun to watch because, like, he cares about the craft. He, he cares about his family. He's one of these guys who is in no way pretentious. But he's just like an all-around good guy. But that's not selling. 
And so the only other option for him is outside of being a legitimately good guy to just play the part of the heel, like strut around as I am the greatest, except unlike Connor, he can actually back it up with title defenses. Okay, so here here we go. I, I, I'm going to tell you. He what should I talk crap to Connor. <laughs> Connor's way too big. Like everyone him. else. Uh, here's what the UFC needs to do. And here's what Mighty Mouse needs to do. Who is the greatest martial arts person ever? Bruce Lee. That's the guy that you need to model Demetrius Johnson as. Demetrius Johnson needs to be, you got to position him as the reincarnation of Bruce Lee. That's what well, you have to do. He's got to do some movies to make that happen. I, you know, I, I perhaps. But when you start looking at what Demetrius Johnson has accomplished and you start looking at things like his speed, his all around technique that to be honest, and, and I, I don't I'm going to nerd out on, you know, our casual listeners just a bit. But when you think about Bruce Lee's vision of the ultimate martial artist who has taken little bits and pieces from all of the different martial arts to create what is Jeet Kune Do, I think that the closest person you have on the planet to that to date is Demetrius Johnson. I think Demetrius Johnson Jones. is the manifestation of Bruce Lee's vision. And so therefore, based on that, I think the UFC needs to make that connection and then then run that image as much as they can. And the problem with that is that connects really well with uh, hardcore UFC, uh, UFC, not even MMA, but hardcore UFC fans. I think that connection works. I mean, they had the whole... Bruce Lee integration into the to the video games where it has to come to make him a household name is the things that Ronda Rousey and Conor McGregor were able to do, which was find outside success from outside the octagon. Like you have to be more present in commercials and TV and, and movies. But the problem with that is he's so successful as a champion because he doesn't do all those other things. So there's no real happy medium here. Like you either sell out and become Mr. Commercial or you focus on being the best fighter that there ever was, but you really can't do both. Uh, and, 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 and there is some truth to that because what we found is, is that whenever you try to do both, eventually the, the grind of doing media wears on you and you don't get the training that you need. And so I don't know how DJ can make them both work. Maybe he's so far ahead of his competition that he's got the most capacity to do it. But the fact is, and, and then we'll go on to the next story, is is that there needs to be a 24-hour-a-day rolling highlight reel of DJ's finishes on every major uh, city and, and station around the country. He needs to be doing, you know, self-defense or you know different types of martial arts exhibitions on on tv i mean i i really do think that um that that's how you make him a star because that's exactly what we need right now is we need mma fans to accept dj as as the greatest the fighters all do Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, but he's proven but people like you need to be able to make that connection, need to see that connection with Bruce Lee and realize that DJ is the, the reincarnation of the of of the dragon. All right. And I don't mean Cisco. <laughs> Unleash the dragon. All right. Kevin Lee. Let's talk some let's talk some more crap about Kevin Lee, because I, I, I am not yeah. done with Kevin Lee by by a long shot. Kevin Lee. Uh, and, and this is on a video by MMA Junkie. I want to give them credit for actually capturing this. They talked to Kevin Lee after the workout the day before the weigh-ins. And Kevin Lee is bragging about having eaten tiramisu the day before the weigh-ins. And he was weighing 19 pounds over the day before uh, he's supposed it's to weigh in. And he shrugs it off like, meh. Absolute hubris. What? Wait, hubris? I, I used that correctly, right? Yeah, Come on, man. I'll just mess up. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure I went to college. Come he was on. a bit cocky. Yes, he was way cocky. It was just like, this is really ridiculous. And, and, and so when he comes in after eating tiramisu, after being 19 pounds over his the weight he was supposed to weigh the day before, he comes out weighing 156 pounds one minute before he was going to be uh, ruled a no show. Yeah. Like that is we, we talk about there are only three jobs that a fighter has to do. Make weight, train 
and fight. That's it. Yep. If you can't make weight, that that is that is the that is like fundamental. And he almost. And if you're gonna miss it, why waste it on tiramisu? That's honestly the biggest thing that bothers me. If I'm gonna miss weight, (laughs) if I'm gonna miss weight, are you kidding me? Tiramisu? Um, It's gonna be brownies. It's gonna be little Debbie's cakes because I'm a fat kid. (laughs) Okay, speaking of brownies, an entire cake. (laughs) Speaking of brownies, we got it. We got it. We got a story about brownies in a minute. Oh, so man. so after after Kevin Lee does all this, he he comes to the post fight and he starts complaining about how hard the weight cuts are and how the UFC needs extra weight classes. So they <laughs> so basically he and and Ariel Hawani and for those of you out there who don't know who Ariel Hawani is, he is like the very first n- journalist covering the UFC before the UFC was even big there was Ariel Hawani and now uh, Ariel Hawani has his own modest but still very impressive uh, media empire that's solely yep. based on the UFC and mixed martial arts um, but they there there's there's this this chorus that's saying that instead of having the was it five or six weight classes that the UFC has there needs to be one at in 10 weight increments 155 165 175 185 195 205 and 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 dana white said absolutely not and i agree and dana White for once is right that's entirely too many weight classes and, and so here here's here's the counter argument to that the the whole reason why people want weight classes is because uh want more weight classes is because they are big fighters who are trying to lose enough weight to fight smaller guys. Yep. And by adding more weight classes, all you do is increase the likelihood that big guys are going to use weight loss to give themselves an advantage. And so you've just created more of this instead of trying to convince fighters to go and fight in the weight class that most suits your body type and your weight. Dana White went off on Kevin Lee and said that they at the UFC provides at zero expense to the fighter free uh free food they provide free nutrition they provide a a a you know a coach to help them cut weight uh healthily and and kevin lee said i don't want it i don't need it i'm a professional i can do it on my own and then he did this surprise surprise that guy was just in every way just completely too arrogant to have even earned his spot at that. I mean, not to say that the guy hasn't fought well. I mean, he, he's strung together the right highlights, but just he, he's he got a lot of maturing to, to do because he made it impossible to be Team Lee. Now, let's, let's, let's put the cherry on top. Dude fought with a staph infection. Like he had a staph infection in addition to all of this stuff going on. He's actually contagious. Yeah. I, uh. to- Tony Ferguson cut him open in the second round. Kevin Lee is bleeding on Tony Ferguson with a staph infection. That is irresponsible. Irresponsible, yes, but you're fighting for the title is there any way that you say no to that like i'm not going to completely hate on him like there's I'm, nothing that's going to no, stop me from I, fighting a title fight let, let me just say that you know tony ferguson is 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 the ultimate um when it comes to uh being a, a professional here because yeah. i would have been livid if i would have found out that uh kevin lee was potentially risking my health because he, he yeah. couldn't he because he didn't want to want to get out of, of of the fight because it was a staff infection. No, dude, I'm I'm sorry, but you know, I, I feel bad for Tony Ferguson because he wouldn't have been able to fight for the title that night. But, dude, that is unprofessional. You don't you don't go into a a, a fight where you're going to be exchanging bodily fluids, fluids. Uh, what kind of fights are you doing? Blood is a bodily fluid, please. <laughs> and Kevin Lee got cut open and bleeding all over. Tony. You saw his pants. They were pink by the time it was over. That's all true. of that is full of staff. I, I hope Tony Ferguson doesn't get ill. So, like, I got all kinds of just just animus, animus towards, uh, towards Kevin Lee about this. I will forgive him at some point because I think he's only 25. He made a lot of bonehead decisions, and he will grow from it. 
He's but, got a great career ahead of him. He just has to do a lot of He maturity. needs to humble himself down. That's all I'm Sit saying. Sit down. That, Be that, humble. You know? Chance the rapper on this, That's man. right. That's right. You know, like uh, like DJ Khaled says, bow down and kneel to greatness. <laughs> all right. Daniel Next. Cormier <laughs> versus Anthony Johnson in the War of Words. I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I do want to call out Daniel Cormier on this because let's just give you guys a quick background on this. So... Daniel Cormier fought Anthony Johnson twice for the for the light uh, light heavyweight title. Daniel yep. Cormier won both times. And the second time, Anthony Johnson said, that's it. I'm done. I got this wonderful new career that I'm going to go into. I'm done with fighting. Okay? Four months later, Anthony Johnson announces that he's considering coming back as a heavyweight. Uh, and Daniel Cormier basically goes off on him and calls him out and says, look, you're, you know, how weak is it that I beat you and then you, 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 you're, you're upset and you say you're going to retire and now you want to come back? You know, why did you yep. retire in the first place? And then Daniel Cormier goes on a complete tangent and tells the story of how he got mad at Anthony Johnson because Anthony Johnson uh, was was supposedly helping. Yeah. Yeah. And he <laughs> thought was helping John Jones in the rematch fight that that Daniel Cormier was having with John Jones and thinking that Anthony Johnson was was giving insight to Daniel Cormier. So Daniel Cormier calls him out very publicly on Twitter and 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 calls him weak, soft, um all yep. kinds of things. Hit Anthony Johnson by surprise. Anthony Johnson was like, "Look, number 1, I'm uh, you know, why are you so mad at me? I didn't do anything. Number 2, I, we're not friends to begin with. Number three, I was just being nice to John Jones. Number four, I'm a more professional that I don't have to, you know, give any trade secrets on what on fighting you because I'm a, I'm a professional like that, you know. And then what I wanted to get to is Daniel Cormier and and whoever is in his camp in his circle, they were all like, Daniel, you're wrong on this. And he came out and admitted that he was wrong. Yeah, I mean. Definitely a crow, and I know that you like that for a champ. Uh, but I'm glad me, you called me a champ. That's good. You know what? Respect. We're done. <laughs> no, the the thing is, like, I, I will give that it was a very mature response. But the even more mature would have been to just sit back and stay in your lane. Like, I, I think this is becoming an issue for Daniel Cormier. It's like he's getting drawn into his commentator role too much. Like. Just be a champion and, and don't focus on, on having to comment on every single thing that happens within the UFC. Uh, f- fair enough. I, 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 I give you that. But I, I do appreciate the fact that he recognized that he was wrong. He calls, uh, you know, says he hasn't actually spoken and apologized face to face to Anthony Johnson, but I don't doubt that he will. Uh, Daniel Cormier seems like a stand up guy. So when you look at, you know, what we talked about a couple of episodes ago where, you know, he recognized that John Jones beat him and he wasn't going to take the title back, even though John Jones cheated, you know, that really says a lot about Daniel Cormier. Um, Then, you know then him apologizing and recognizing that he did Anthony Johnson wrong. I think that that, that shows a lot of character and, you know, I respect that in a sport that is uh, is built upon that ethos. That's fair. That's fair. It's a nice contrast to Kevin Lee. All right. Let's go to the last, last story of the day. There is a guy. His name is Luis Philippe Alvim. He goes to watch a fight and ends up as the champion. Okay, it's like the ultimate Texas A and M twelfth man type story. Yeah, this is the twelfth man of MMA right here. We'll call him the twelfth man of MMA. So there is this thing. It's called the Juiz de for a uh, for a fight or something like that. And he became the world the the welterweight champion. So this is what's supposed to happen. There's a guy. His name is Carlos Eduardo Rufino, and we know that Eduardo is also called Dudu Bro. Right? And he was supposed to be fighting. Claudine Cow, but Rufino missed weight, like Kevin Lee almost. <laughs> Call was going to fight Rufino anyway, even though he was overweight, but then at the last minute, Call pulled out. So you've got this main event of this card where one guy missed weight, then the other guy pulls out, so they don't have a main event anymore. Alvim, on the other hand, he's a black belt in Muay Thai. He and his girlfriend wanted to go see the fight. They cooked some brownies, okay? Remember you were talking about brownies before instead Indeed. of tiramisu? He cooked some brownies. And what they were going to do dessert. is they were going to go at the fight venue and sell the brownies to make tickets, to, to buy tickets. 
But see, everyone had already gone inside, so there was no one on the street. <laughs> so well, they it started wanted, off as a very enterprising idea. Yeah. So what they decided to do was do something very irresponsible, and they decided to use the money that they had saved for bills for the month to buy the tickets. <laughs> now, yeah, come on. Okay, Let's... go with me here. So since he's a he's a, a black belt in Muay Thai, his coach was actually coaching some of the fighters that were there. So he goes in the locker room to visit his coach and finds out that they don't have a main event. Okay? So he's like, sure, I'll fight. I mean, I got nothing to lose, so I'll fight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> goes and talks to the promoter, but the spot is already taken. Someone else has already signed up to fight. So the guy's like, okay, well, at least we got a seat for the fight. 40 minutes before the fight, the guy who was supposed to fight backs out. So they don't have a, they don't have a main event anymore. So they got they call Alvum out of the stands and they're like is the most hokey promotion that has ever existed. <laughs> they call this guy out of the stands. They put some gloves on him and he wins the fight. <laughs> That's like two just most random human beings ever decide oh to fight gosh. for a title. So so they hand him the belt, he gets down on one knee, proposes to his girlfriend, and they ride off into the sunset. Happily ever after. It is a great story. Like that is Until a fantastic story. <laughs> That's solid. I All mean, right. that is, yay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that I mean, is. It seems so ridiculous. Like, how does one just kind of come out from the seats and like, yeah, sure, I'll be the winner. <laughs> You know, that that's the stuff that movies are made of. You know, the, you know, sometimes art imitates life and sometimes life imitates art. <laughs> In this case, this was a, a, a fantastic feel good story. And I think that's a great way to end this segment as well as our show. Follow us on social media on Twitter. I'm at CST Ryan and I am at CST underscore the letter K and the letter C. You can check us out on our website at www.combatsportstalk.com. You can also find us and subscribe on iTunes and on SoundCloud. And please, please like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram. Casey wants to show you that he can lift a couple of pounds. Just a few. All right. Well, our theme music is composed by Scott McCurry at scottdeancountry.com and Casey Onyebuchi produced our lead-ins. I want to thank you for joining us for another edition of Combat Sports Talk for Casey Onyebuchi. I'm Ryan Smith reminding you to keep your hands up, your chin tucked, and throw balls.